Your Honors. May it please the Court, I'm Steve Brannick of Brannick & Humphreys, representing the Martinez Estate. I'm here with Mr. Burlington, who represents the Steele Estate. And as I stated before, I'll be presenting the arguments on behalf of both appellants and plaintiffs. I'd like to reserve five minutes of my time for rebuttal, if I may. We're appealing from the trial court's dismissal of our complaint. So the question before the court today is whether we stated a cause of action. The critical allegations, which of course must be taken as true for the purposes of the argument this morning, is that Georgia Pacific owned some industrial property. There was a 300,000 gallon water tank on that property that Georgia Pacific allowed to become severely corroded. Georgia Pacific knew of that severe corrosion, knew that that severe corrosion presented a grave risk to parties who would be on that property, then sold the property to a company in consulting owned by Mr. Brousseau, and actively concealed in the course of that sale this dangerous defect. The allegation is that the buyer of the property, Mr. Brousseau, was not likely to be able to find that defect. And as a result, that water tank exploded and the two plaintiffs were tragically killed in this case. Our simple point, yes. In order to go where you want us to go, we're going to have to find an expansion of the existing law in Florida. Would you agree with that? I would disagree with that, Your Honor. Tell me why. There are two ways that we can win this case. The first way we can win this case is based on the concessions they made in their brief. They concede in their brief that under Florida law, if a caveat emptor does not apply, if the seller of property actively conceals a defect, a dangerous defect from the buyer. Is there any case law indicating that caveat emptor does not apply in a commercial transaction? The concession they made is that in a commercial transaction, caveat emptor does not apply if there's been active concealment. And we have several cases that were discussed in the brief that make that absolutely clear. So that's the first way we can win the case, is based on their concession. Now, they try to step back from that concession by saying that despite the fact that there's an allegation of active concealment, and there clearly is an allegation of active concealment here, they're not liable because of the contractual relationship that they had with Mr. Brousseau, that they sold this property as is. That contractual relationship between Mr. Brousseau and Georgia Pacific has absolutely nothing to do with the liability and the duty that Georgia Pacific and Brousseau may own to a third party. To use an obvious example, on my way to the courthouse today, I might borrow my neighbor's car. And my neighbor and I could sign a contract that says that if I run somebody over on the way to the courthouse today, neither of us is going to be liable to a third party. Obviously, that third party, if I were to cause an accident, would not be bound by that document. That document might address the respective liabilities between myself and my neighbor, but would have nothing to do with my neighbor's duty to that third party under the dangerous instrumentality doctrine or my duty. Is there any case finding a duty owed to a third party once a seller has divested itself of ownership and has no further control over property? Is there any case law that would authorize a stranger to the transaction, an unknown third party that authorizes a duty owed to such an individual? Well, first, there are the cases on active concealment that I've talked about before. And then secondly- That would be between the buyer and seller, would it not? If anyone had a claim for active concealment, it would be the buyer, which I don't really see how that could be since it's an as-is sale. But how does that inure to the benefit of your plaintiff, who is a third party to all this? Is there any case authority for a duty owed to a stranger to the transaction once the seller has divested itself of ownership? Absolutely. What would that be? That would be the Bass v. Jones case out of the First District Court of Appeal. That's a case that applied Section 353 of the Restatement. And the other way that we're asking this Court to rule for us is by adopting Section 353 of the Restatement. Twenty-nine states, including Florida, have adopted- That is not adopted in the state of Florida. Yes, it is, Your Honor. I respectfully disagree. If you look at the- Restatement? Yeah, the Restatement 353. If you look at the Bass v. Jones case, which is the case that I'm talking about, this was a case that is on all fours in this case. We have 
a seller of property who was aware of a dangerous defect in the fireplace. Sells the property to IBM. IBM then leases the property to a remote third party and the third party suffers damages as a result of that hidden defect. The third party sues the original purchaser, just like we've sued the original purchaser here. The First District Court of Appeal in the Bass v. Jones case applied Section 353 of the Restatement and said that that remote purchaser had a cause of action against the seller of the property. Now, they try to get out from under the Bass v. Jones case in two ways. First, they argue that it was a residential transaction, not a commercial transaction, so all the court was doing was applying Johnson v. Davis, which of course we all know requires a duty to disclose defects to a buyer. The problem with that argument is that, number one, this sale took place long before Johnson v. Davis became the law of Florida. Bass v. Jones was residential. No, it was not. That's my second point. This property was sold to IBM. Obviously, IBM wasn't going to be living in that property. It was sold to IBM because IBM was going to turn it around and lease that property, and there are two cases that were cited by the parties in their brief that indicate that that's a commercial transaction and not a residential transaction. If you look at the Wasser v. Sisoni case that's discussed in the brief, that's a third DCA case, 1995, it says that the sale of rental property is commercial, and they've got the Agrabin v. Botanica case, also a third DCA case, which says that the sale of a condominium unit, when it's going to be contemplated that it's going to be rented out, is a commercial transaction, not a residential transaction. So there are two good arguments as to why the court was, in fact, applying Section 353 to a commercial transaction in the Bass v. Jones case. You have an unusual situation here because Simplex, Mr. Steele, both plaintiffs work for Simplex. Is that correct? No. They work for another party that was hired to come and fix the fire suppression system on the property. Simplex was the company that was hired to inspect the property. Okay. So they were working for the company to fix what? I believe the added fire. Simplex had originally determined that the water tank was deteriorating, correct? Right. The owner, Georgia Pacific, is told about that. Georgia Pacific sells, and they either don't disclose or they affirmatively misrepresent what is going on at the property. Buyer buys as is, and then the buyer ultimately wants to get the fire suppression system going again. And for some reason, I thought Simplex got involved again. Maybe I'm not correct on that. Right. Shortly before the sale, Simplex comes back to the property. Simplex, of course, is the party that had told Georgia Pacific that you've got a problem in this tank. Georgia Pacific, there's an allegation and a complaint that Georgia Pacific told Simplex, you don't have to worry about the tank anymore. It's been inspected, and it's passed. So that raises a whole other slew of issues as far as whether Simplex was entitled or could reasonably rely on that. Right. But then you've got Simplex. Did Simplex bring in the fire, the folks who were going to do the repairs to make it all operational? The new owner brought in the new. The new owner using Simplex as well, or Simplex was out at that point? I don't remember what Simplex's role in the property at that point in time. What I do know is that the new buyer was, when the new buyer asked about the fire suppression system, the new buyer was referred to Simplex and the fire marshal. And our point is that both Simplex and the fire marshal had already been fooled by Georgia Pacific. Georgia Pacific had already told the fire marshal. Which again sort of begs the question of how could they reasonably rely on Georgia Pacific. But again, that's really not part of this right now. Because those are going to be jury questions. All we're saying is that everybody should be at the table and the jury will sort out those questions. But then you get to the employers of the, the employer of the injured parties who are hired to do repair work. Right. Is their area of expertise, does this raise a jury question or is this appropriately resolved? They're brought in to fix whatever is wrong. Right. How are they misled and how does the employee benefit from the fact that there's been misleading? Well, because all the cases, and I see where Judge Black is going. I mean, all the cases have different circumstances with different levels of either reliance or possible reliance. And now we're getting fairly remote when your client's employer is there to do the fix. I respectfully disagree that it's remote at all. But there are really 
a number of questions wrapped up in, in your, your question. First is there is no doubt that there's going to be lots of finger pointing when this goes to trial because the uh, Georgia Pacific and Brusso are going to say, um, United Fire, you should have known to inspect that tank. United Fire is going to say, Georgia Pacific and Brusso, we had no reason to know that there was anything wrong with that tank. It had passed an inspection. You had told it, 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 us it had passed an inspection. That, so it, this is on you and not on us. Our point is that Georgia Pacific, <coughs> Brusso, Simplex, and United Fire all need to be at that table pointing fingers at each other as, a pointing, as opposed to pointing fingers at the empty chair, which is what we're going to have if Georgia Pacific is out of the case. So all of those questions about whether it's too remote or not, or whether they should have discovered the defect or not, are going to be classic jury questions. They're going to be ultimately resolved by the jury in this case. But in terms of whether this is remote, no, this is not remote at all. There is absolutely no dispute in this case that if that water tower had exploded while Georgia Pacific still owned that water tower and it had injured workers on that property, I don't think there's any dispute in the case that those property, those invitees on the property would have a lawsuit against Georgia Pacific. Why does it become any more remote the next day after a sale if that same explosion happens and somebody else happens to own the property? If we've made the important and narrow um, allegations that we've made here, which is that Georgia Pacific actively concealed the defect and that the buyer was not likely to find out that defect. There is nothing remote about that. That is perfectly foreseeable. There is a duty, and that's what the restatement now says. You, now you tie back into the buyer likely to find out. The buyer contractually agreed to find out whatever might be wrong or not wrong with this property by virtue of the due diligence right. as is language. And that's between the buyer and Georgia Pacific as they sort out their respective liability between each other. That contract between Georgia Pacific and Brusso, however, so can't have any impact on position, a third party. Is it your position that Georgia Pacific would have had an ongoing obligation forever until someone else discovered the defect in the water tower? Their obligation was to reveal the defect. If they do that, they so are they are clear forever. That begs the question of the due diligence. Right. What the, I don't, here's I what don't the, know that you can ignore that. When they say, we don't have any duty to do anything, you've agreed to buy it as is and do your own due diligence and figure out what might be wrong with the property. What the restatement does is, well, it, impo go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry. is it imposes a tort duty on sellers to reveal the existence of a dangerous defect in those circumstances when the buyer is not likely to find that defect. That's perfectly sound public policy. Why in the world would we encourage a seller not to reveal the existence of a, a defect? Let me just use help an obvious... Me out, help me out here. You, you keep referring to the restatement and you cite me to the Bass v. Jones case, which is the first DCA case right. in 1988. In the, in the Haskell case in 1993, the first DCA says they have not adopted restatement 353. Right. And that, I mean, the, the Haskell case, I, I, I confess, is a mystery to me. Judge Webster and the, there are, here, here's one, let, let me, let me complete that thought. Number <laughs> five years after you, you tell me it's adopted and they're saying, hey, you know what? It might be a good idea to adopt it, but we're not gonna do right. it. Well, you know, courts, courts make mistakes. <laughs> but first and foremost, there's a lot about Haskell that obviously we embrace. Judge Webster looks at a situation like this and says, you know what? Caveat emptor doesn't make any sense. Right, but, we should but, they, but, but he concludes that it still applies. Caveat emptor still applies in the commercial setting. Right. It's not extended as in the Johnson v. Davis situation. And 353 has not been adopted. And we're going to certify this to the Supreme Court, who's done nothing with it. Well, that's so, because, yeah. so getting back to the first question I asked you, th this is going to require us to make the extension that the first wasn't willing to do in Haskell. There are two ways to approach that, Your Honor. First, we think that, that Judge Webster in Haskell was wrong because, as I talked about before, the, uh, the Bass v. Jones case had already adopted 353. And for whatever reason, Judge Webster overlooked that. Maybe it wasn't briefed very well. I don't know. But, the, but, but if you look at Bass v. Jones, you'll see that Judge Webster was wrong. And then secondly, I think that Judge Webster was also wrong when he said that he didn't have the power to adopt Section 353 of the Restatement. And 
understand that when Judge Haskell, uh, when Judge Webster in Haskell certified a question in that case, he certified the very big picture question to the Florida Supreme Court, which is, should we adopt, should we abolish the doctrine of caveat emptor period in commercial transactions? That's a very big question, and I, I would certainly concede that only the Florida Supreme Court could, could answer that question for us. But we're not talking about that big picture question here. We're talking about whether Florida has or should adopt the restatement uh, second 353, which is just a very narrow exception to the doctrine of, of caveat emptor that only applies under a pretty extreme set of circumstances, the kind of circumstance where we had here, which is when you know of a defect, you hide the defect, and you know that the, the new party is not going to be able to discover the defect. That's something that doesn't happen very often. But so 29 right, states uh, have looked just at to, Just for a timing standpoint, you've basically started entering the rebuttal time. Now, I understand we have two cases here, and you all agreed 20 minutes should be enough. If you want to take a few more minutes, that will be fine, and I'll right. still reserve the rebuttal time. But don't go too long. Uh, I, I won't, Your Honor. But 29 states have made that decision to adopt that narrow exception to caveat emptor. And I think that, that this court and Judge Webster in the first DCA, just like the previous judge in the first DCA, Judge Zemer, I think it was, in the Basby Jones, adopted that incremental exception. And I think you could do that, number one, because they've already conceded that if they actively conceal that they are liable. And it's also consistent with Florida law uh, as, as demonstrated by the Slavin v. Jones case that we, that we talked about extensively in our brief. That, that's the venerable old case, as we all know, where a contractor is liable to remote parties for a defect that's hidden in construction that you're not likely to find. A very similar situation where the Florida Supreme Court has already decided that, number one, it doesn't matter what the contract says between the owner and the contractor. The contractor still has an independent duty in tort to that remote party who's not going to discover that defect. And, and uh, so you have that, that duty, and privity doesn't matter as, as all. So when you have that background, I think it's very easy to adopt that incremental exception. I think a really good example of that is the Gable v. Silver case. It was decided in 1971 by the 4th DCA. At that time, it was the law in Florida for 100 years that caveat emptor were applied in residential transactions. But by the time of 1971, states all around the country had been starting to find an implied warranty of habitability in connection with residential property. And the 4th DCA, instead of just kicking the question upstairs to the Florida Supreme Court, recognized that the law had sufficiently evolved where it was prepared to adopt that implied warranty of habitability in Florida. It did, and the F Florida Supreme Court ultimately approved that, uh, praising the 4th DCA for reaching that conclusion. Our point there is that the law evolves and that district courts of appeal can be involved in the evolution of the law, just as the Florida Supreme Court can be involved. So I think that the, the four, the, just as the fourth district adopted the implied warranty of habitability in Gable B. Silver, the first DCA had the power, this court has the power to adopt this very narrow exception to caveat emptor in connection with this case. But if you disagree, then what we would request would be an opinion that suggest that you believe that your hands are tied by existing Florida law. We don't think that's correct, but if that's the way you come out, and then certify the question to the Florida Supreme Court, then we can, then, that we can present our issue to the Florida Supreme Court. 29 states, including Florida, we think, have adopted this, the, the 353 of the restatement. It makes sense, and for those reasons, we think we've stated the cause of action and that this case should be reversed. Very good, thank, thank you. you. You'll have an extra four minutes if you <laughs> wish to use them. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Stacy Blank from Holland and Knight. I'm here today on behalf of the Appley Georgia Pacific. The appellants asked this court for the first time in Florida's history to impose on a former owner of commercial real property a duty of care in favor of remote third parties who are injured by defects in the property. According to the appellants, the court should impose that duty despite the fact that premises liability cases like this one impose a duty of care only on the party who possesses or controls the real property at the time of the injury, despite Florida's continued adherence to the doctrine of caveat emptor in the context of commercial sale, sales of commercial property and despite the express terms of the purchase and sale agreement in this case in which the buyer consulting 
explicitly disclaimed any duty on the part of Georgia Pacific with respect to the condition of the property. For obvious reasons, no Florida court has recognized such a duty. The appellant's claims in this case fail as a matter of law for the simple reason that they cannot allege the existence of a duty on the part of Georgia Pacific in favor of Mr. Martinez or Mr. Steele. Now, under Florida law, the duty to protect third parties injured by dangerous conditions on the property rests solely on the party who has possession or control of the real property at the time of the accident. The duty does not turn, as the appellants suggest, on the former owner's knowledge of the dangerous condition or even creation of the dangerous condition. Instead, the duty rests only on the party who has possession and control of the real property. Here, Consulting bought the commercial property from Georgia Pacific under an as-is contract six months before the accident. As a result, uh, one thing I'll add too, the plaintiffs alleged in their complaint that after that sale, Consulting maintained exclusive possession and control of the property. As a result, Georgia Pacific owed no duty of care to Mr. Martinez or to Mr. Steele, and the fact that Georgia Pacific knew of the dangerous condition doesn't change that conclusion. Because the issue turns on uh, control rather than knowledge, is this case any different from the case that this court decided entitled Jones v. Basha in 2011, Judge Silberman offering that opinion? I don't think it does, Your Honor. I mean, essentially what Florida has said is that we are going to impose the duty on the party who is in the best position to become familiar and to correct a problem. Here, that was consulting. Consulting had exclusive possession and control of the property and had for six months. Mr. Martinez and Mr. Steele argue that absent an adoption of the duty that they urge in this case, injured third parties will have no remedy for wrongs in circumstances like this, but that's not accurate. Mr. Martinez and Mr. Steele have a remedy here. It's just not against Georgia Pacific. Now, the appellants also suggest that Georgia Pacific owed Mr. Martinez and Mr. Steele a duty of care that was somehow derivative of its duty to disclose defects in the property to consulting. Caveat emptor is still the law in Florida with respect to commercial property, and equally important, the as-is contract here included express provisions in which consulting disclaimed any obligation by Georgia Pacific well, to as, uh, Mr. Brennick makes a point, which I think is correct. The as-is uh, language and the due diligence language between the seller and buyer are really irrelevant as to the injured parties. The, the question is, mm -hmm. Does a duty extend from the former owner to third parties down the road? But I think his answer on that is problematic because I don't think the appellants can have it both ways. They depend on the relationship between the buyer and the seller, and that is the duty to disclose as the source of the duty to them. Even under 353, all 353 does is create a duty on the seller to disclose defects to the buyer. So you can't have it both ways. If you depend on the relationship between the buyer and the seller as the source of the duty, then you can't disclaim the as-is provision or caveat in I think Mr. Brannick qualified that today when I asked him a question earlier. I think he said that it's an ongoing duty uh, to third parties regardless of the buy-sell relationship. Maybe I'm interpreting it too much. But I think that's the problem is that if he is arguing that 353 is the source of the duty or an exception to caveat emptor is the source of the duty, then it is not an ongoing duty. It is satisfied or uh, subject to the same limitations that are imposed with respect to 353 and caveat emptor. So I guess what I'm saying is on the, on the duty side of the equation, He's content with 353 and relies, in fact, on the relationship between the buyer and the seller. And we know that because he says satisfaction of that duty by disclosure to the buyer would be enough. 
And so my point is that that comes with the same conditions and limitations, including if, if you are relying on our duty to disclose as the source of the duty to you, if we don't have a duty to disclose or we have satisfied that duty to disclose by virtue of a contractual waiver, then you don't have a direct claim against us. And again, if you look at 353, you'll see the only duty in section 353 is to disclose to the buyer any defects. Now, you know, for the same reasons, you know, the, the appellants argue that caveat doesn't, caveat emptor doesn't apply in this case because caveat emptor never applies in tort claims for personal injury damages. Even a cursory review of the case law is sufficient to reveal that that is just not accurate. Caveat emptor has always applied to bar tort claims for personal injury damages. It, even in Haskell, the first district applied caveat emptor to bar personal injury claims by third parties against a former owner of commercial property, which is exactly what we have in this case. The appellants also argue that the commercial residential distinction that Florida observes in connection with caveat emptor does not apply in cases involving section 353, again going back to this theme that caveat emptor deals with the economic relationship between the buyer and the seller, but 353 is more concerned with uh, tort claims brought by injured third parties. But if you look at 353, 353, just like caveat emptor, deals with the seller's duty to disclose defects in the property, and that is the very duty that Florida has rejected in the context of commercial property sales. Now, finally, the appellants argue that the trial court erred in dismissing their complaints because they adequately alleged active concealment by Georgia Pacific. Georgia Pacific acknowledges that active concealment of a dangerous condition by a seller uh, is an exception to caveat emptor. We do not concede that the appellants prevail in this case, though, because the problem is the one that the court pointed out and that is that a claim for active concealment belongs to the buyer here, not to the third party appellants. If in fact consulting believed that it had been active, you know, it had been misled, if, it, if Georgia Pacific had fraudulently concealed the condition of the property, consulting may have had a claim against Georgia Pacific, but the appellants would not. Um, it, it, it is a very confusing theory, I think, because the appellants premise a duty that Georgia Pacific owes to them on Georgia Pacific's purported misrepresentations to someone else for the purpose of misleading the buyer. You know, th that just makes no sense to me. The way that it is designed to work is that the third party plaintiffs, if they believe they have been injured, they sue consulting. If consulting believed it had been misled with respect to the condition of the property, then it may have a claim against Georgia Pacific, but the appellants can't jump over consulting and, and bring a claim that properly belongs to consulting. The second problem, I think, with the appellant's reliance on the active concealment argument is the terms of the purchase and sale agreement itself. Florida case law holds that a sophisticated purchaser of commercial property who buys under an as-is agreement cannot assert a claim based on active concealment so long as it had an opportunity to conduct the inspection and that the defect was reasonably uh, discoverable through ordinary diligence. That's exactly the circumstance in this case. Georgia Pacific sold the property to consulting as-is, where-is, with all faults and defects. Consulting in the agreement expressly agreed that Georgia Pacific and its agents did not make and had not made any representations about the condition of the property. It disclaimed any obligation by Georgia Pacific to do so. It stated that it had not relied on any representations by Georgia Pacific and affirmed that it had inspected the property and had become thoroughly familiar with its condition. And finally, consulting assumed the risk of any defects in the condition of the property, including particularly any latent defects. Thus, even if the allegations were sufficient to establish active concealment, here, 
consulting assumed the risk of latent defects, including concealed ones. Consistent with the terms of the contract, the appellants further alleged in the complaint that consulting's principal, Mr. Brusso, personally inspected the property, including the water tank, and had superior personal knowledge of the water tank's condition. In light of the undisputed terms in the contract, the appellant's allegations of active concealment fail as a matter of law. One brief point about the request for certification. Certification is unnecessary in this case to provide the appellants with a remedy. They have a remedy against the party in possession and control of the property, consulting. If consulting believed it had been deceived, it had a remedy against Georgia Pacific. I thank you for your time. Ms. Blank said one thing that I absolutely agree with, which is liability should rest on the party that is in the best position to prevent the injury. Now, that's obvious in this case. If we accept the allegations of the complaint as true, which is that Georgia Pacific knew of this hidden defect and that Brusso was not going to find out about this hidden defect, which of these two parties, Brusso or Georgia Pacific, is the party in the best position to prevent this injury? Obviously, it's Georgia Pacific, and that's the entire purpose of the restatement. That's the entire purpose of Section 353. Again, it's a very narrow exception to caveat emptor because you've got to prove that there's knowledge of the defect, and you also have to prove that the party that's purchasing the property is not likely to find that defect. That doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's clear that the party that's in the position to prevent that injury is Georgia Pacific, the seller, not the buyer, when there's a specific allegation that the buyer's not going to find it. And that's exactly what Section 353 is designed to do. Now, they argue that there's no duty. The Florida Supreme Court has spoken to the issue of duty in the Curd v. Mosaic case, which the Steel parties brief very nicely in their brief, and it talks about where does a duty come from? A duty comes from if you create a zone of risk that raises a risk of injury to a third party. That's exactly what has happened here. Their deception, their failure to reveal the existence of that hidden defect has created a risk, and that any third party that came on that property anywhere near that water tank was a foreseeable plaintiff who could be injured by that risk. There is no question that there is a tort duty under black letter law principles here. They say that, well, that the plaintiffs will have a remedy. They can sue Brousseau. Well, of course, we have sued Brousseau. And what's Brousseau going to say? Brousseau is going to show up at trial and he's going to say, we knew nothing about this defect. They lied to us. And so we're not going to win against Brousseau if the jury believes Mr. Brousseau. And if they're correct and Georgia Pacific is not in the case and we have no cause of action against Brousseau, that means we have no remedy at all. These plaintiffs who were killed by this deception would have no right of recovery at all. That cannot be the law. One thing that's kind of puzzling to me, and I think Judge Silverman started down this road when you were up the last time, which is the individuals that were killed, they were there to fix the water suppression system, right? Right. So they knew it was nonfunctional. They were there. I'm a little perplexed as to what they were supposed to be told and by whom, since they knew there were problems with it and they're presumably the experts that presumably would have thought, you know, we better be careful about putting 300,000 gallons of water up here because this system doesn't work. It hasn't worked for a long time. This might be a problem. I think you've raised some great arguments that are likely going to be argued to the jury in this case, but the allegations in this complaint are that these guys were brought in to fix the pumps. But you're asking us to find a duty not just to some random third party who happens on to something that's defective. You know, it isn't just like the water falls from the sky on unsuspecting people. These are unique individuals that presumably know about such things. What the complaint alleges is that these two individuals 
were, were brought in by a company known as United Fire, right. and they knew that the pumps were broken. They were there to fix the pumps. There was no allegation in this. There is, we, we don't know whether they were experts in the, the tank and the structural and the, and the structural aspects of the tank. That's going to be an argument that I'm sure will be played out in front of the jury. No doubt Brusso will argue, no doubt Georgia Pacific will argue that, that you guys are the experts. You should know, in addition to, to knowing all about the pumps, you should know about that tank as well. And maybe the jury will buy that argument. But maybe the jury will decide based on the evidence, and we don't know what the evidence is going to disclose yet, but maybe the evidence is going to disclose that these guys don't know anything about tanks. Maybe water, maybe the water tank aspect of the structural system is not within their expertise, and they're there just to fix the pumps. If that's the case, then they are certainly, just like any other invitee on that property, within that foreseeable zone of risk. Uh, just a couple of other points I'd like to make. One is that there actually is a decision in this court um, that references Section 353. Now, it's not a decision that applies Section 353, so I don't want to overstate it, but it's the Edna case that we discussed in our brief. And in that case, it was. If we applied it, I think we would have heard about it before the 11th minute of your uh, rebuttal. I frankly uh, forgot it, and Mr. Burlington was kind enough to remind, remind me that I hadn't mentioned Edna. But Judge Altenburn talks about this duty that there's a potential duty by a seller of property to a remote plaintiff when there's been concealment, and he cites to Section 353. Now, he hasn't adopted it, but he cites to it. We think that the Basby Jones case has, in fact, adopted it. And if, if, and if you disagree with that, then we think you should do what Judge Webster did in Haskell and ask the Florida Supreme Court to help us with that. But Mr. As I Brennick, we're about at the end of your rebuttal time, so if you wish to wrap up, now is a good time to do so. I will, will do so. The one thing I didn't hear from counsel, and I, which I, what I'd like you to think about is my parting comment, is she's made a lot of arguments about why 353 doesn't apply. 29 states have found that this is an, a worthy exception. What you never heard from Ms. Blank is why shouldn't 353 apply here? It makes perfect sense. It makes good sound policy sense. 353 should be adopted. We think it was adopted by Bass, and for those reasons, this court should reverse. Very good. Thank Council, you, thank you very much. That concludes the oral argument portion of the document. Topic, we are adjourned.